Okay, excellent. Right. Sorry, I just need to move stuff around. I'm always adjusting. Okay. Awesome. Hello, everybody. You're all very welcome uh, to Her Plus State of Manchester. Um, we have our uh, Twitter tag and handle here as well as our uh, meetup uh, link there if, if you want to engage with us at all during this event. Um, but just some general guidance for tonight. Do please be kind to yourself and others. It's been a long several months of lockdown and I know things are starting to ease up, but we still have a lot of stressors on us and, and there's a lot going on. So if you need to leave at any point, please feel empowered to do so. Um, this will be recorded and published to our YouTube channel so you can always catch up later. Um, so in that case, uh, do turn on your video if you don't mind sharing your face. It's really helpful for our speakers to see you um, and helps you engage a bit more. Um, but also if, if you do mind being uh, in the recording, please feel free to turn off your video as well. Um, do keep yourself muted when not speaking in order to minimize the background noise. Um, I'll also probably go through and mute people um, if I do hear background noise, so please don't take offense to that. Um, uh, feel free to engage and ask questions in the chat, and you can also private message me on the chat if you experience any issues. Um, and then finally, please don't share the Zoom room link publicly, and that's just to avoid Zoom bombers um, and other sabotagers of, of the call. We do have a code of conduct that you are expected to abide by. Uh, we don't tolerate harassment of any form. We wanna make sure that this is a welcoming and inclusive community to all our members and participants. Um, if you do experience any misconduct or need to report something, you can either private message uh, myself here on um, Zoom or we have an email address that you can send a report to and we will follow up with you and um, remedy the situation and make sure that um, that we take care of the incident. And you can read the full code of conduct um, at this link. It's just linked off of our meetup page. But anyways, welcome to Her Plus Data. Our mission is to bring together women with a connection to data, to provide a safe space where we can support and celebrate each other, share experiences and knowledge, establish meaningful connections and talk data. We do try to keep the scope very broad to be as inclusive of as many women within um, STEM subjects as possible. So um, if you're just interested in data, you can be a beginner or a student embarking on your career, or you could be you know, a founder, a CEO. Um, we, we welcome everybody and we love to hear about everybody's different pathways into data roles. Um, I'm one of your organizers. My name is Rachel. We have uh, Bernadette on the call if you just want to wave, Bernie. And I think Mona's on the call as well, possibly. Maybe, maybe not. But anyways, if you want to get in touch with us about anything, our Twitter handles are there. Um, we've been going for almost three years now, and I like to take group photos at each event. So this is your like one minute warning that I'll be taking a, a group photo in Zoom. Um, so if you, would, if you would like to be a part of that group photo, this is sort of what it'll look like. And we would love if you um, shared your face, but of course, um, please don't feel like you have to. Um, our events are the second Thursday of each month, um, and this is to make it uh, more uh, consistent and easy for you to save the date. Our next event is Thursday, August 13th um, at the same time. Uh, it will again be online. We'll probably stay online for the foreseeable future because we don't want to um, facilitate any risk to our members, um, and we'll be announcing the speakers soon. We are open to and actively seeking collaboration on events and adding more events uh, to our normal meetup schedule if there's anything that you want to collaborate on or anything that you want to see. Please do get in touch if you would like to speak at an event or suggest a speaker, if you want to suggest a theme or a topic for an event, or if you want to collaborate on an event. This is your community and we would, we would love to engage with you and provide you what, what you want to hear. Um, so here are all the different ways you can connect with us, either on meetup, Twitter, YouTube, Slack, or email, and I'll post all of these links in the chat so that it's easier for you to access them. Um, a huge thank you to Bernadette and Evolution Recruitment Solutions, who support of all of our events um, and, and help organize them as well. Thank you so much, Bernie. Um, a thank you to the Software Sustainability Institute uh, for covering the cost of our meetup page. And then tonight, uh, it's our 28th meetup, but our fourth event online. And we have a wonderful lineup tonight um, with Viv, Priya, and Essen. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for volunteering your time to come speak to our community tonight. We're really looking forward to hearing um, your stories. 
Um, and then we just have a few announcements. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something I've shared before um, about diverse and equal techs um, GoFundMe to raise funds for uh, research into uh, um, uh, black voices and representation within tech. There is a blog post that Annette Joseph, the founder of Diverse and Equal Tech wrote um, about her personal experience and um, the link to the GoFundMe is there. They're also uh, looking for people to um, get involved. So if you wanna be a mentor or if you are underrepresented with tech and wanna share your experiences and get involved in the research, um, then I'll share links where you can do that as well. And they've raised over 4,000 pounds. So it's, it's really exciting so far. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to seeing uh, the research that comes out of this initiative. And then Carrie, if you would like to unmute and talk a little bit about Speakers Live. Hello, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, yeah, Speakers Live is a project I've been working on uh, with a friend of mine, um, where we're, I have been organising a meetup group in Liverpool and we were finding it quite hard to, to find speakers for certain topics and knowing people outside of our network. Uh, so we've been working on this platform so that speakers can register for it and then event organisers can go on there and search for speakers um, within certain topics or, or within a certain area or anything like that. So at the moment we've kind of launched it and are looking for feedback. So if anyone either is a speaker and like to register then the links on the side here um, and yeah just feel free to go and make a profile you need to fill in some details for your profile to be displayed on the main page um, or if you're an event organizer or just fancy having a look and giving some feedback um, just visit the page and I've got a survey um, that I can put in the chat as well if that's okay um, that yeah it's just a few questions like how easy is it to navigate around is everything clear um, and any comments so it'd be brilliant to get some feedback to get some more speakers involved um, and we plan to once we we process the, the feedback we plan to have a big launch and um, get things moving a bit a bit more so yeah thank you <laughs> awesome thank you so much Carrie uh, yeah it's going to be really really helpful once once that's up and running and it's got a really great database of speakers um, so I'm going to take a quick group photo, if that's all right. If you want to be in it, now's the time to um, share your video, but if you don't want to be in it, that's absolutely understandable. And I'm going to take a screenshot in three, two, one. Thank you so much for humoring me. That's like the one thing that I couldn't really give up moving online. Right, and now we're going to get started with our first talk. So Viv, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let me share screen. Okay, there we go. Hi everyone, that's me. Um, I'm Viv, I'm the founder of an influencer marketing agency called Be Influence. So thank you so much for having me and thanks to Dr. Rachel Ainsworth for organising everything. Um, I hope everyone is doing okay. I know that question has suddenly taken on a whole other meaning and, and I really wish we could have done this in person, but really grateful that we're able to connect uh, using technology. So I first came to a Her Plus Data event last year at the Auto Trader building. And even though I don't actually work specifically close to data, I don't work with data scientists, computer scientists, data analysts, I don't even have the word data in my job title. But even so, I got a lot out of the event. And one thing that I absolutely loved was just how supportive the women were in this group. Uh, the speakers were so brilliant, uh, presented their talks with humour and frankness, as well as brains. And I do tend to go to a lot of networking events. That's kind of part of my job. But this one really stood out to me as a really special one. Um, I am just so impressed with those who work in data, especially women, because I know my brain doesn't work in that way. It's not that way inclined as much as I'd like it to be. So when I see anyone who's able to talk about code, equations, data stuff, you can tell I'm not a data person at all. My mind is always blown. Um, so your 
you might be wondering right now, so wait a second, why are you here if you don't even work in data? Um, I actually came up to Rachel at the end of the event and I said that I'd love to hear a beginner's talk about data and how it's incorporated into roles such as marketing, which is what I do. And Rachel just went, sure, why don't you do it? <laughs> and so here I am. So in high school, uh, here's some pictures of me that you can uh, laugh at, feel free. I was one of those kids where I wasn't really like quite clever enough to be one of those high achievers and go on those like gifted and talented trips. Um, but I also wasn't one of those kids who needed any kind of special attention either. I was very much middle of the road, kept my head down and just floated my way through school. So I was a good student, always did my homework, only ever got one detention uh, for forgetting my homework actually. So I'll never forgive my drama teacher for that. But I never really excelled in any area. Maths, as much as kind of I would love to have played up to the Asian stereotype, was not my forte whatsoever. My mum and dad invested a lot of time and money into us getting extra tutoring for maths and I just wasn't very good at it. But one thing that I did enjoy was performing arts and even then I wasn't very good at that. Um, I wasn't one of those triple threats. I could, I think I got like, um, I was just into dancing and that was it. And you can see me here just kind of uh, with my hand on hip, being a bit sassy. But despite that, I probably played down my academic achievement. So I studied marketing at uni and in 2012, which seems like an age ago, I achieved a first class honours degree, uh, which is good, even after being dumped by my ex-boyfriend whilst writing my dissertation. So yeah, thanks for that ex-boyfriend. And this photo is the day that I graduated, um, my proud parents there. Um, but funny story, I actually sprained both my ankles that day just before we had to walk down the, the, through the ceremonial walk uh, to collect my certificate. And I had sprained ankles for weeks after that. So since then, I have gone on to have a career in marketing. So these two photos probably sum up my career in advertising. This is when I worked at an advertising agency in Manchester. This was a toy shoot that we did and it ended up being a 24 hour toy shoot because some kind of machinery broke down during our toy shoot. So the first photo is me wrapped in bubble wrap because we were in a really cold dark studio with like a cuddly toy snake. And the same night there's a photo of me using a toy mat as a blanket. So that was a sad and sorry night. Um, but I definitely did do some work though. And this was probably my first initial foray into learning about how data plays into advertising as we explore things like econometrics in our campaigns. I then moved down from Manchester to London, um, working at an agency called Glean Futures, where we manage social, me social media influencers. So they're known for managing the likes of YouTubers like Zoella, Tanya Burr, the Sukoni Jolies. Uh, my role was essentially in talent management. So meaning that I managed the careers of these social media influencers. So from beauty influencers like Pixie Wu, um, Carly Rowena, who's a fitness influencer, the Sukoni Jolies, you can see here, who are family influencers, and Joshua Peters, who the guy who's known for pranking Katie Hopkins, essentially, on YouTube. I don't know whether you guys saw that video at all. That, yeah, so that's him. Um, I got to do really cool things like work with dream brands on influencer campaigns like Cadbury's, Estee Lauder, even bagged a trip to Tui Cruises. So this is a picture that I took when I ended up in Cuba of all places um, for a campaign, which was super, super cool. Um, and that was two weeks before I left that job. So I was extremely jammy um, and even have my name in a top selling record breaking book called Face, which is a makeup book. And from here, I really learned how to closely work with influencers from the process in terms of negotiating contracts, negotiating fees, providing data from an influencer's content to brands and agencies. But my personal life wasn't all that great. It looked great on Instagram. Personal life wasn't that great. Um, my dad died after a 10 year battle with cancer. So when I was in London, I came back up north after a year down there and I eventually returned to the sweet sweet north and um, started my own business as an influencer marketing agency called Be Influence after receiving private investment so here's me at various um, things that I've just thrown myself into. Um, we work with clients such as Vistaprint, I saw it first, TikTok, the social media app, 
Aaron Says of Scotland, which is a lovely beauty brand, to devise full end-to-end -end influencer marketing campaigns where we find influencers using data to fit our clients' objectives. So we also do the full shebang in terms of campaign ideation, the execution, so making sure that the content goes live on time as per advertising standard authority guidelines, as well as reporting back comprehensively using data. So aside from my career, I'm a proud feminist. I care about Black Lives Matter. I love napping. I love eating dumplings. I like traveling. Um, and I'm, e I'm an ESFP, if anyone is into their Myers-Briggs personality types. Um, I started a podcast called But Where Are You From? Uh, to help bring more representation to British East Asians during lockdown. But who hasn't started a podcast during lockdown? I feel like everyone has. <laughs> um, but it's really nice because I've managed to connect with other East Asians who are similar to me, which I really enjoy. So the big question, what the hell am I doing here? Does data play a part in influencer marketing? So if we can do a tiny bit of audience participation, so either raising your hand or using the hand raise button on Zoom, how many of you have had experience working with influencers? Let me just make this bigger. Any hands? No hands. Okay. How many of you think data plays a part in influencer marketing? A few, few hands, a few hands bobbing up there. I'm not sure. sure. So um, how many of you, just out of interest, follow an influencer? So whether that's in the data world or even your regular beauty, fashion, lifestyle influencers. Cool, cool, cool. So hopefully in today's talk, I'm going to show you the basics in terms of how data works in influencer marketing and as marketers, how we report it back to the client. So let me just, just maybe one second whilst I just move you all where I can see the PowerPoint and yourselves and my slides. Okay. So firstly, let's look at the term influencer. So the term influencer, apart from the, the usual term of, of influencing people, the actual term influencer was added to the Oxford Dictionary last year, I think it was. So it's a person with the ability to influence potential buyers of a pr product or service by promoting or recommending the items on social media. Now, I don't quite agree with that term because that's just a part of what influencers do. A lot of it is content creation essentially, as well as promoting products or services. But if you think about, um, if you've ever persuaded someone, your best mate to try a new restaurant that you want to go to for lunch, or your colleague to watch that amazing new Netflix series, you're technically classed as someone with influence. We all are in some areas of our lives, but we might just not be making a career out of it just yet. And another thing that I get asked a lot is whether influence marketing only works in fashion and beauty. And the short answer to that, to that question is no. So unlike many types of marketing, influence marketing is essentially universal. And the reason why that is, is there's always going to be someone influential within that certain sector. So I've worked with companies like accountancy firms, insurance firms, banking, paint, literally creating content about watching paint dry um, but the key is to work collaboratively to come up with creative content with the brands with the influencers so the short answer of that is no but we do see a lot of influence marketing within fashion and beauty and then when it comes to the different types of influencers so i think as humans we like to put things in boxes and like categories and i'm sure as, as data people that works well in terms of your types your, the way your brain brains work but there's lots of different types of influencers out there, but I think we can put them into three broadly speaking categories. So we firstly have digital first content creators. So these are the types of influencers that we usually work with the most in my role. And these are individuals who have built considerable audiences and influence on their social media channels by creating content on their own platforms. So take Victoria in the fro. She is a luxury fashion blogger and she built her following online by starting a fashion blog. And she actually graduated with a PhD in fashion consumer behavior and began lecturing in fashion marketing. And so her blog started as a hobby, but then it started gaining traction. Um, she launched her own designer handbag line, worked with the likes of Armani, GHD, Dior, Daniel Wellington. 
So her journey is very typical of what we call a digital first creator. So her main role, aside from the many different revenue streams, is content creation. <clears throat> and then we have celebrity influencers. So these are obviously traditional celebrities who have made their fame in other areas, whether that's presenting, sports, acting, and have gained a large social following because of their mainstream fame. So they're also being monetized on social media and celebrity endorsement is nothing new. We're just seeing it marketed on different platforms now. So Holly Willoughby is a brand ambassador for Martin Spencer's and promotes various other things on her Instagram account. And working with celebrities is usually very effective for larger brand awareness campaigns and is seen as the traditional celebrity endorsement route. And then we have the likes of reality TV influencers. So Kim K, everyone, the queen of reality TV. Um, don't know about you, but I suddenly like the Kardashians after binge watching all of Keeping Up With The Kardashians one really rainy afternoon. Um, so whilst we, we kind of take them with a pinch of salt, there's some reality TV influencers who are a bit of like flash in the pan type of influencers, specifically thinking of Love Island, Towie, that kind of influencers who have gained a bit of a kind of a bad reputation for promoting an un inauthentic and irresponsibly marketed products such as like diet shakes and teeth whitening products and all the likes. Um, so we do tend to see that within the press, the, they talk about all these different types of influences within the set, they tar them with the same brush. So if you ever heard um, the BBC talking about influencers not promoting or not disclaiming that it's an ad properly, it's usually more so the reality TV influencers, the celebrity influencers, who they don't do that as their day job, whereas digital first creators are very good at disclaiming because that's essentially their bread and butter. They do that day in and day out. <clears throat> so does size matter? So obviously a bit of a tongue in cheek question here. So a common misconception is that in terms of the follower numbers, the bigger the size of the influencer, the more persuasion power that they might have to sell for a client or brand. And one big gripe in the industry is that market rates are usually based off the follower size to begin with. But in most cases, um, this doesn't really tell us that much in order to gauge whether an influencer is the right fit for a campaign. So we have to dig a little deeper and this is where the data comes into it and taking it back to marketing basics essentially. So we look at things that um, we not, can't necessarily see just from looking at an influencer's profile. So things like their audience demographics, the age, the country, the gender can be a really good indication as to whether a brand is worth working with and worth working with an influencer so for example if you are a uk car insurance brand targeting families working with say a young female um, influencer with six million followers but she has a predominant 80 percent male audience let's say based in australia for example and we can find out all this data it wouldn't necessarily be that, be that cost effective so looking at things that we can't necessarily see, such as the brand sentiment, their previous brand partnerships, who they've worked with before, their engagement rate, uh, the reach and the impressions and all that data that we can request helps us make a more informed decision when it comes to who do we work with. So I'll take an example client. So I'm going to take you through a report that we put together for a client of ours. So the client are a online printing company who are known for helping small businesses with their marketing needs. So their business objective was to drive more brand visibility and product consideration during their biggest quarter, which was between October and December from business owners. So our strategy was to target UK micro influencers, which are usually around the 10,000 mark who own small businesses. So they wanted to look for businesses with a physical location as well as an online business. Um, they might, for example, participate in local fairs, markets or other events. They all should have strong branding and ideally talk to their followers about their branding and building their business. So from the objectives here, we can see some quantitative measures and some are some that are less obvious using data. So, for example, a physical location or an online business, as well as strong branding. That's quite difficult to determine from just data alone. So we try to get all that data together and then look at these factors that we can't necessarily see just from the numbers. And then a big part of our process is basically finding the influencers. So we then look at and request their data. So you can see here, 
if you've ever looked, I don't know whether you guys, any of you guys have a Instagram business page, but you can essentially see your insights on Instagram. I've set mine up so I can just see it out of interest. Um, so we can see that, um, for example, we asked for predominant UK audience. So if we wanted to say 50% over um, uh, UK audience, and we can ask for that data. We want them to be small, medium business owners who are based in the UK. We want them to be a micro influencer or even a nano influencer, which is teeny tiny around the 5,000 um, followers mark. Um, they have a minimum engagement of 1.5%, which sounds really low, but that's essentially anyone who engages in your content. So anyone who likes your, your content, anyone who comments on your content, and that's, we take the average of the five most recent posts divide that by the follower numbers to work out how many people from your followers are actually engaged in your content. And then we want to look at a mix of male and female genders when it comes to um, the uh, gender breakdown. So we request this data firsthand. So there's lots of influencer marketing platforms which are SaaS products, like third party SaaS products. Um, they use third party data. And the reason why we don't go down that route is because it's assumed data um, and it's not entirely reliable. So say, for example, we want to work with a UK based influencer, but they travel all over the world. They're likely to tag when they're in Bali or Brazil rather than tagging when they're in Warrington, for example. And so these third party SAS data is based off that base their location off their geo tags. So it's never quite accurate. So we always prefer to request that data directly from the influencer firsthand. And then, like I mentioned before, we then look at the qualitative, qualitative data, such as the quality of their content. We also take into account diversity. This is obviously very, very important and something that we have to consciously push for and make a conscious effort to include uh, because a lot of platforms that we use are biased. So Instagram are very biased towards white influencers. And so we, we have to make that effort to find black and people of color influencers because the social algorithms just don't help people of color or black people at all. Um, we look at what brands they've worked with before and we also look at things like their tone of voice, the things that we can't quite get the data for in terms of that sense. And then we set the benchmarks. So we, we set number of influencers that we'd like to work with, the pieces of content that we'd like to get the average engagement rates and the cost per engagement. So the budget divided by the cost per engagements. And then we make the content happen. So this is the most exciting part where the influencers begin to create content. And then we get that back. We send that to a client. They check they're happy with it. We make some amendments if they need to. It then all goes live. And here's where I try to talk about data. So influencers then, we ask them to send through their screenshots of their analytics around 24 to 48 hours, depending on the platform. But say on Instagram, a, a post usually has a lifespan of around 40 hours, really, uh, until kind of it dies a death. On YouTube, it's probably around seven days that we report back to the client on. And then we collate all these numbers together. And then we also look at things like Google Analytics. So say, for example, we can look at the sessions, traffic to site, any discount code redemptions, the sales, the bounce back rates. Uh, and we can try to figure out which influencer has driven which sale by using trackable links. And then we input all of this data into a sexy looking spreadsheet, uh, which I'm so glad that I employ someone who's much cleverer than me to do this because honestly, I don't know how people can stare at Excel all day. It's just, I'm scared of it, if I'm honest. Um, but there are lots of tools out there that automate this whole process, which would probably save a lot of time. And I'm not saying that our process is perfect, but this is just how we've done it um, going forward. And I haven't found a platform that fully automates the full end-to-end -end service that we offer. Um, because we essentially say to our clients that we offer a very much a bespoke approach uh, and plus they're really expensive. So we try to keep it um, this way. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's a little video I forgot. Did There you go. And then we produce a lovely looking report. So that's called data visualization, right? <laughs> so then we pop this. We try to make sense of it. We pop this. 
into different graphs and spreadsheets. So I've changed all these numbers, but essentially this is to give you an idea of what we present back to the client. So we look at our benchmarks and then we say what we did. And usually it's, um, we surpass those benchmarks. Thank God we can do something with our jobs. So this is just to give you an idea in terms of how we present back to the client. Um, and I think like one thing that I found because, because I don't understand data like innately, I wanted to make sure this made sense to someone who didn't understand data. So I knew that this was being sold in to marketing teams who are probably similar to how I work, who are then selling this into stakeholders who don't, wouldn't necessarily want to see that spreadsheet. So we were trying to make this as easy to digest as possible. There we go. Some more, some more graphs and stuff. Um, and then this is basically yeah showing the instagram story stats as well so things like for example we look at the impressions so how many times a story for example has been viewed or replayed the action so this is something that's really quite interesting that we don't get to see on the front end of any kind of a social post so actions count as any replies back to a social uh, an instagram story profile visits we can also track website link link clicks uh, sticker taps so clicking on the handle campaign hashtag taps, all these things are really valuable um, data that we actually can't see from the off, from um, just looking at a post, but it's actually quite valuable to the client to see that because it means that people are actually engaging in the post. And then brand sentiment. I don't know whether you call this qualitative data, but I just kind of guess that. So this is essentially what people say about the campaign. I had to, I had to take out the ones that included the brand name, but I just included a few in there just to give you an idea. And then if we look if we're looking at redemption codes, then we also include that data in there. And that's usually from the client who reports that back to us. And then we pop that in there. So in summary, data is integral for a successful influence marketing campaign. Um, our process isn't perfect and we know we're very much beginners when it comes to data, but we understand the importance of it and we won't be able to set our objectives, benchmarks and report back to our clients without it. Um, so basically, if I can do this job, anyone who works in data will definitely be able to do it probably way better than I can. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Priya and Essen on their talks as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Viv. Can we have a virtual round of applause for Viv? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, we just have time for uh, one question. We have one in the chat. Um, Kurt, uh, Christy too, would you like to unmute and ask your question or I can ask it for you? Yeah, sure, I can ask it. Um, I was just interested, so you said um, you measured the quality of, con mm. of influencers. Mm. Um, and I was just asking, like, how do you measure the quality of influencers and do yeah. you the, the social impact and values of an influencer? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, obviously it's very subjective, but I think because we work with so many, we look at kind of the shooting style of their content, whether it's consistent within their social media posts, um, or it might be their videography, for example. So if they have a certain style of shooting, that's taken into consideration too. Um, so that's kind of what we mean in terms of the quality of the content. Is it just kind of like high quality, well shot, nicely produced images or content? Um, do we consider the social impact and value of the influencers uh, what what exactly do you mean by that? Sorry. And that like if if an influencer wasn't perhaps didn't have so with everything that's going on about like Black Lives Matter, yeah. if they were like sustainable, would you consider mm -hmm. that in terms of the the content that they yeah. were Can you measure that? Definitely. I mean, it's hard to measure, but we do definitely. What we do is we painstakingly research them. So we Google them. We go through their content. We look at kind of if there's been any kind of PR surrounding them, we would tell our clients about it and make an informed decision together based on that. So I think things like um, whether they support Black Lives Matter right now is extremely important. Um, and also looking at things like um, any scandals they've been in, we also take that into account. But ultimately, we know that influencers are humans too, and they make mistakes. It's all about kind of how they come back from that and whether they've been held accountable to that essentially. Um, so we do take that into consideration, but it also it very much comes down to our clients because they range from fast fashion clients to online printing businesses to 
um, beauty businesses. So it very much comes down to the client too, whether they they are, it's something that they value as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I do think we have to move on to the next speaker, but um, Vic, you do have a few more questions in the chat if you don't mind answering yeah. those there. Sure. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, let's all thank Viv again. That was really, really um, enlightening to see what goes on on the other side of Instagram. So thank, thank you. you so much for, for being able to share with us. Um, next, we're going to move on to Priya, if you would like to unmute and share your screen. I'm going to share my screen. No? Can you see the screen? No. Yeah, oh. it looks great. Okay. <laughs> I can see we can see the slides, but it's not in presenter mode yet. If depending on how you want to do it. So is it? Is it okay now? I'm just loading the data. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for inviting me and uh, uh, Vivian. That was uh, really a very interesting for me to talk. Um, I'm going to share my experience with data. Uh, first, uh, thank you so much for everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you all. I'm going to start from my non-data science career uh, where I worked as a software engineer in Tori Harris Business Solutions, developed a web services for a telecom company using um, uh, technologies like Java, Spring MVC, and MySQL. I have also worked as an assistant professor, teaching a lot of subjects, including uh, service-oriented architecture, web technologies, and also distributed systems, and uh, many other programming languages, including C, C++, and Java. I have also organized uh, state-level workshops and uh, national-level workshops on Android and uh, .NET technologies, and have given guest lectures on um, Spring, Hibernate, and Struts technologies. And I was funded by uh, Council of Scientific and um, Industrial Research uh, for organizing a seminar on uh, energy of our computing. So this is a moment taken at our uh, Android workshop. I was uh, teaching uh, nearly 76 students at the same time, and it was really very big and very challenging moment in my life. Uh, and moving on to this, so I have authored um, three books, one on Android, cloud computing, and uh, service-oriented architecture. And if you want to know the com contents of the book, you can always go on to the research gate. It's available there. And um, so I started my data career in Charlie Harris Business Solution, where I designed, developed, and tested a project that is entitled um, uh, Sentiment Analysis for Twitter, where live tweets are analyzed. For example, if you are searching for some term, in, so for example, Black Lives Matter, so you want to know about what people are thinking about that particular uh, term. So for this, I used uh, R language. So I get the tweets, uh, live tweets using the Twitter API. So I analyze it with our language and Datamox API is used to analyze the sentiments and categorize it into a particular tweet into positive, negative, and neutral. And also used uh, Shiny, which is a uh, R package, which is used to uh, create a creative dashboards, interactive dashboards for uh, a web application. And um, Moving on to the reproducible research, I started my PhD on reproducible research. So uh, on the left side, you can see, sorry, on the right, you can see the computations, two computations. So th the goal of these two computations is to analyze sentiments of tweets. So in the first case, it is I used a software dependency text blob for analyzing the sentiment. In the second case, I used NLTK. So if you see for the same set of tweets, I have observed the different results. So this explains the issues in the computational reproducibility. So uh, Zohar at, and et al, uh, who has uh, tried to uh, reproduce the experiment, which was authored between 2007 and 2012, nearly 80% of the workflows either uh, output different results or fail to run altogether. So that's main a uh, motivation for my PhD to investigate the computational metadata of two 
similar computations to understand why the result of one computation is different from others. For this, I uh, used workflow management system. So you all know about workflow management system, which helps to ease uh, computation reproducibility. And the provenance is the uh, data uh, information, how a particular data is generated and how uh, it is used. So provenance give all such information and ProvDM is a data model which is recommended by W3C which explains or which uh, tells how we can represent a workflow. For example, a workflow is a, uh, if you think about workflows, you have input, output, intermediate results and also the process on that data. So you consider this as a uh, graph which uh, all the uh, input, output, and intermediate uh, data are considered as entities, uh, whereas the process on that data represents activities. So this is how we can represent a workflow uh, data. So I developed a wide, wider uh, system. So think about this as a first workflow and second workflow, and the third one represents a difference graph, which highlights what are the node has been inserted, deleted, and updated. So this tells why we are observing different results uh, from one computation to another. And I used uh, Java, Neo4j, and Prologfax, and uh, PostgreSQL for this. And this is a moment taken at IEEE workshop on um, uh, big data. Uh, I was an organizer. I organized this workshop as well as a hackathon. And uh, uh, as a technical com committee member, uh, I reviewed uh, BDGMM workshop papers as well. And as a KTP associate uh, between Creation360 and University of Manchester, I developed a system called Audit Cloud, which takes the audits and make the real-time analysis for, from different uh, data sources. So this uh, main functionality includes creating the surveys and assigning branches and assigning auditors and take the surveys and uh, compare uh, survey results. So this, uh, uh, this image shows the main functionality of Audit Cloud, which is uh, managing clients, auditors, surveys, and also managing questions for the uh, particular survey and viewing the survey result of a particular branch, as well as comparing the survey results of uh, one branch with the other. So this is a sample graph, which is gener um, generated using D3, which is uh, data uh, driven document visualization. So you can see how we, are, we have plotted and this uh, shows the survey performance for branch one and this one shows the for survey results of branch one based on the category. So we had uh, five different categories, which is compliance, customer service, and uh, hygiene, speed of service, and support, and also survey performance for branch one, which shows the difference between the original score and uh, how much score the particular survey has actually secured. And this one so shows the percentage um, difference between the original score and the answer score. Uh, this one compare survey results. So this is used to compare uh, the survey performance of one branch with other branches, including the top uh, 50 survey results as well. And as a research associate uh, at University of Manchester, I involved in a square kilometer array project. So this is the world's largest uh, data, sorry, radio telescope project and the sites are at uh, Australia and uh, South Africa, which is now integrated into the phase one of SKA. And the volume of data is very vast and uh, data rate is uh, 23 terabit per second from antennas to correlator as well as uh, 14 terabit per second from correlated to the HPC and which is equivalent to 12,000 petabytes per month. And right now 15 countries are collaborating in this project and uh, I am I'm working on with Mirkat data. So what is Mirkat? Mirkat is a Karo array telescope and radio telescope which is consisting of 64 antennas in the Northern Cape of uh, South Africa which is inaugurated in uh, July 2018 and it's a precursor of uh, SKA. So how we are transferring the Mirkat data from South African side to the UK side, we, um, uh, so all the South African side are managed by the DA. IDA is an institute which provides the researchers from South Africa which, uh, with uh, cloud resources, as well as uh, the IRIS uh, is funded by UK, 
uh, research and innovation which provides digital uh, infrastructure for uh, computing here in UK. So we need to transfer the data sets that are collected from the MIRCAT site to, uh, to the UK site, that is IRIS. And uh, they, uh, each data set are of approximately 1.3 terabytes each. And we use Globus, which is uh, to transfer the data between these two uh, systems, of, uh, which is an open source service, which enables you to faster uh, transfer the data, which is more uh, uh, you know, fast, faster than uh, traditional SCP and uh, or sync transfers. And uh, so this is a framework, how we are transferring the data. As I told, this involves uh, several steps. The first is uh, from the IDA, it is transferred to the Manchester High Memory uh, Machine with uh, uh, using a Globus data transfer. And from a High Memory Machine, it is transferred to the uh, physical uh, storage using a data a transfer library called GFL copy, and then it is transferred to the logical uh, file catalog where each and every file has will be given a, a separate uh, logical file name, which is used to buy the derived jobs on the IRIS machines. Um, so this is a uh, Meerkat pipeline. So I'm not going to too much detail into this. So um, we, uh, we process the Meerkat data using three major steps. The first is uh, data processing, calibration, and imaging. So basically the data processing and calibration takes very little memory to process, whereas the imaging takes higher memory to process. So you see uh, it shows that what are the um, uh, scripts that consume more memory and what are the scripts that consume less memory. And this is a sample run of Meerkat pipeline on I IRIS data. So as you can see that the data processing and the calibration consumed very less memory and whereas the calibration, sorry, imaging step has taken uh, consumed more memory. And we take uh, reproducible research very uh, seriously in astronomy. I, I think Rachel knows about it. We use uh, dockers and singularity containers and we package uh, software applications in uh, as a container. So we don't need to uh, rely on the software dependencies. We can just uh, uh, launch the container as such and for Jupyter, we also use Jupyter notebooks for interactive uh, programming and GitHub for storing the code, of course, and uh, we use uh, common workflow language, which is a, a standard language for uh, developing analysis, data analysis workflows, basically, and a lot of applications uses uh, uh, CWL, uh, which is um, biomedical as well as astronomy applications, and uh, you can uh, actually merge two or more workflows written in two different languages. For example, you have a workflow that is written in R language, and you have a workflow uh, that is written in Python. You can able to merge using the CWL, and also uh, mm, CWL can help you to. Uh, collect the provenance of each and every workflow run. So we, we intend to collect the provenance of the uh, workflow runs for our Meerkat pipeline as well. Uh, so I'm also a YouTuber and I started my channel for my kid and we publish uh, videos every week. I have a ded dedicated play playlist for data science. So far I have published uh, uh, four videos, one on data science, another is uh, elastic search architecture, and uh, data visualization as well as uh, Neo4j graph database. You can see this uh, link if you want. And that's all about my journey with data. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you I'm so much, time, right? I'm on time. How long did it take? <laughs> Thank you so much, Priya. Um, can we have a virtual round of applause for Priya? I was just going to uh, your YouTube channel to share the link in the um, chat. There we go. Um, I think we have a question from the chat. Uh, Usha, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Apologies if I pronounced your name wrong. Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Uh, okay, yeah. Hi, uh, Priya, thank you so much for the information. This was so, like, I mean, I'm taking down notes already. Okay, so, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, you were talking about sentiment analysis uh, with the yeah. Twitter. Uh, so actually my current, so for my thesis, I'm actually working on Twitter data. 
uh-huh. so that pretty useful to know about it so uh, did you uh, how did you annotate the training set so i'm facing issue with that so uh, because the data i've collected does not have a target set like does not have a target set so how are you how did you annotate it yeah so basically all the stop words we um, remove all the stop words and then so this is not the library that i i have developed myself i used uh, datumbox api as i told and there are a lot of apis that are already available uh, to do this particular natural language processing sentiment analysis so so i have already dis- uh, discussed three apis so if you have seen it uh, datumbox api nltk api as well as uh, uh text blob api so these all do the same work actually okay, okay. thank you so much <laughs> i think i'll go over the slide i mean the videos again thank you so much thank you so much uh any final questions for priya if not uh feel free to um add any questions to the chat and she can um answer them there um, but thank you so much, Priya, for for talking to us. It's it's really nice to see all of the reproducible research going on <laughs> as part of the SKA. Um, and I also work in the same office as the CWL folks. So if you ever want oh, to connect okay. with them about anything, um, just yeah, let me know. Sure. I'll definitely come to you. <laughs> awesome. I was gonna say work in the same office. We haven't been in the office for months now. Um, anyways, um, we'll move on next to Essen, who looks like she's in a very tropical paradise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Raisha. Thank you for Bernie and also for yourself for inviting me for this meeting. I will not share the content, the presentation. Indeed, that presentation I will be showing to you will be mostly to inspire you and share my experience. And that's why there is just a kind of very nice uh, friendly girls talk, I would say. Uh, I will talk about a CEO. I was a CEO. I worked for healthcare industry for 25 years. I was the general manager for the, for a while for Medtronic, for Philips, and also for GND in the past and Microsoft. So I worked for mostly multinationals for 25 years, and I had also been honored by Forbes magazine, Economist magazine, as one of the top 50 CEO of the country. In number one in healthcare, but number 14 in the oil industry, which means, I mean, you might see many stuff about the CEO, uh, which is a visible part, that is the tip of the iceberg. But I will be sharing with you, inspire you in general, as the ladies, mostly, we have some self-limiting beliefs. And whatever you are doing at the moment, I just want you to just pay attention. You might have some self limiting belief about where are you, it might be a student, you might be a kind of assistant, or any position that you're holding today, what is your dream state in the future, what you are doing today, and the in between the obstacle is mostly ourselves. I will give example to highlight my background. I have studied linguistics, a cognitive learning at the university. I got a degree from MBA from UC from Los Angeles. I had later on Harvard AI training and IoT training from Columbia University. So I, I also studied nerve science. Where I was a junior for Philips, I was selling MR uh, machines like my resonance, where for the, like let's say, for the neuroscience, where marketing is already is being utilized under the function MRI, how we are giving decisions. So, Brain is my hobby. I was in the operating theater in the healthcare arena as a space rep. I was a space rep starting and being struck in the OR and more than 1,000 live cases. So I touched the brain, I studied the brain, so I have visualized brain under MI. I like the spiritual part also, which means I will be talking to you about the career path and some of the obstacles we are having. Uh, it might be a self-limiting belief. I will be talking to you pure scientifically, plus a little bit spiritually also. Uh, for example, I would like to give an example. Before I was generally 
and outside world were telling me, SM, you cannot be a general manager for Dutch company. I said, why? Because mostly it, uh, it was a Dutch company and mostly the senior management, they were Dutch people, white and men, under Saxon, 50 years older than 50 years plus, you should be mature and you should be engineer, mostly Christian people. And they told me you are Muslim, you are Turkish, you are woman, you are early 30s and you are not an engineer, no way you cannot get your manager. Indeed, mostly we are listening to the outside world to find excuses in ourselves that we would like to believe that we cannot be because somebody is telling us we cannot be. Indeed, although I was ignoring the outside world, no, I can be, but meanwhile, I was not disclosing I had a very big fear, which means mostly we are staying with our neocortex, our conscious telling, yes, of course, I am the general manager, I can be anybody else. I mean, that is this, what we are saying to outside world. But in our subconscious mind, we might have some obstacles, self-limiting beliefs. We might think that we might have a lack of confidence, lack of love, lack of being enough, or, or many other fears. In my case, I was saying very gravely outside world, being a woman, not any kind of obstacle for my subconscious mind, I had a fear. My fear was I was not good enough having the knowledge for the finance. And my subconscious mind was telling me, Listen, if you're going to be general manager, you are going to screw the company. You have no clue about it. If there is a fight between your conscious mind and subconscious mind, mostly, and always subconscious mind win. Then I realized I was studying a lot about how I can just overcome this obstacle. And I was always finding excuses. They will not assign me a general manager. It's going to be in the long future. But whenever I had a focus on myself about having a self-awareness about my biggest fear, my message to you, find out what is your self limiting belief do you ever have self-sabotage for yourself in my case it was i should be knowing everything mostly women as women we are so perfectionist we want to be so good for something else if you are going to be deserving then i realized uh, i got some also lessons and also some classes and i realized my self-limiting belief was i was not feeling good enough to be assigned a general manager because the dumb fear it was a kind of fear for myself then what happened accepting your biggest fear meeting with your dark side your fear your concern where you are not able to talk to other sides other people but in your talk self talk find it out in my case i found out i was feeling i should do everything else then awareness made a big relief on my shoulders and i said okay i don't have to know all everything else then i realized i can ask for support ladies mostly we are not asking for support we want to do everything by ourselves if this is a group of ladies around you you are a great team great people you will learn from each other as russia mentioned the objective of these calls Sheer experience, not only for the data science, functionally what we are doing, it's human beings, what we need to learn from each other. How we overcome the problem. My case, it was a big relief, I can ask for support. It was a big relief for me, then I said to myself, okay then, then you don't have to be knowing finance perfectly, but you can hire the best finance person, best supply chain, best uh, IT, best HR. Then I was thinking, I am just the orchestra chef. I have to be in 
instrument, the piano, the violin, the guitar, are the manager two years later, that because being the Dutch expatriate uh, person, a CEO, supposed to be after two years, since in my conscious mind, I made a big awareness, big quantum leap, and I became a German manager in a week. In a week. It was my miracle. And it is so important, my suggestion to you, find out where you are, what you are, what is your self-talk if you are having a self-sabotage. And before, uh, uh, before becoming a German manager, uh, again, it was in other company, I was going to be hired. I was pregnant, for example. And I was telling to the headhunter, I am very happy with my job. I am pregnant. I wouldn't be hiring myself as a pregnant person. And I was very surprised with the company. They were looking forward to have a meeting with me by noticing I was pregnant. And I was very surprised with the company. Uh, I, ha I had got many talks with the guys. And then at the end, I got the job. Although I wasn't asking or looking for a job. And the company, they told me, we are for finding for the talent. And you are talent for us. And they waited for me eight months after we signed the contract and I had the delivery of the baby and a pregnancy leave and mostly the company, everybody might see the potential in you, the talent in you. But first of all, you should be seeing the talent in you. You should be realizing how much we are valuable. Mostly, we are forgetting that we are so valuable. We forget ourselves. We are fighting and we are working, trying to be like men. We try to be like Amazon ladies. We are fighting for the home, for the kids, for the family, for our lovely, beloved ones. Or we are fighting for something to deserve. One comment for you, mostly in even North America, for the same graduates from North American women and uh, men, women are earning still less salary, uh, more or less like 7% less salary than men. And why? Because we are thinking, if they are good enough, they are going to increase our salary for the promotion or whatever. We are not demanding. Because asking for something, demanding is something, is something not ethical for us. And we fight for others, but not for us. My point to you would be, to have your self-value and not only fighting functionally whatever you are doing at a university, at a college, a private company or a public company, wherever, whatever, and please just check it out where you are so great and what is at a self sabotage for yourself that you are having this obstacle. So for my career path, I worked for 25 years in the medical device industry. And this year, uh, I was feeling I'm very successful. I repeat myself, and with the new era and the healthcare, we are going to be living minimum a hundred years old, ladies. Because technology, life sciences, even today, we are going to be having our organs produced with 3D printing, which means you are not going to be asking for liver or kidney transplantation in the future, you are going to produce in your body. If you are, I don't know where, what is your age, if you see your club also in the country, I give the example. Whatever brought you here as a successful person, you might be, as in my case, I was CEO, last 25 years, to repeat myself, it will not bring me to another 25 years of success. So I should make adaptation to myself to learn, adapt, and do something different. So I did a degree from Harvard last year from in, in Boston. Then I decided to establish my own company. Essential Evolution is my own company, specialized in many areas, but mostly AI and smart variables. And coincidentally, whenever I was back from US, a company from Manchester called me, it's called a startup, and to keep advisory board members, which means 
in Spain, living in Istanbul, but anywhere in the world. Don't limit yourself thinking that you are mostly, I think, living in Manchester. I am from Istanbul, uh, but I have uh, just a kind of advisory role in uh, executive role in, uh, in Manchester. I was traveling there on a monthly basis because of pandemia. I actually didn't just fly, uh, but you are going to be showing your talent to all over the world. I asked the company, where did you find me? They told me, you are an expert in health, life sciences, medical devices, AI, and you are a woman leader. That's why they wanted me to join their group in Manchester. Just brilliant. My message to you, look for future. My message for you will be dream something. And I will be asking you tonight or tomorrow, whenever you want, write a letter to yourself from the age of 90. Once you are at 90 years old, tell, write a letter to yourself of today, of yourself, and what you have achieved in life, what made you happy, and go for the future, and the future self, for today's self, write a letter. Look at your, well, while you are writing, my kind request for you would be, do not take the pen out, have a continuous writing. Because when you stop, the mind interferes. Whenever you write continuously, your soul, your, your upper self, writing to you, which means you will in the future. And the future is shaping your past, which is today. And there's only one time, and of course, it is now. And whatever you dream today, and you wish and be in this resonance and attract it as you would like to have it. And most people are confusing with some simple book like, like Secret saying, you will get what you want. It is wrong. By the quantum physics, you are going to be attracting who you are, not what you want. If you are in the conscious level, in the resonance, in prosperity, abundance, like Success, love, or whatever, or beautiful, whatever are the stuff you would like to feel it at the moment. That's why the future letter will support you. You will have the confidence in yourself. You are going to be, yes, you are not going to be there. I know the path. You might have different roles, blocks, or whatever, but you are going to be ultimately reaching what you want. So my message would be uh, think about the future, dream for the future and find out tonight what are your obstacles that you might have some self sabotage for yourself. And I think uh, my time is up or not, I don't know uh, if you have time, or uh, I can talk until morning. Yeah, that's why just uh, warm me up for the timing. You can continue for a few minutes. I ran over with the announcements and messed up the schedule, so please do continue. For the last thing I will say, because the technology team, uh, in for mostly for the, the technology, I will give you one highlight for the women awakening and AI. Because it was my study I showed in, in Harvard very shortly. Most people talk about the IQ and EQ, but there are two other elements, which is PQ, physical intelligence, SQ, spiritual intelligence. My I was claiming it will be a head fork in the future. AI, artificial intelligence, is easily replacing mostly, uh, I wouldn't say only man, but masculine world. IQ, mathematically relatively stronger, and also physical intelligence with robots, for example. AI is replacing easily IQ and PQ, and it is not replacing at all where women, the feminine energy is very powerful as you are. It is the EQ, emotional intelligence, and SQ, spiritual intelligence, which means, as you might know, artificial intelligence, there are three elements very important. RPA, robotic process optimization. The second layer is cognitive insight. Uh, and the third one is cognitive engagement. That in the equation is so important, EQ is so important, where the ladies, or I will call it feminine energy, it is rising, 
And as a woman, we are not going to be in the new era of technology only a player, but we are going to be a game setter. That's why new era is so important with the data science, technology, machine learning, with machine learning, IoT, all of the blockchains or cryptocurrency, whatever, they are all coming, but AI is going to be the, the already a very important uh, area. And in, in Turkey, I have found uh, recently this is quarter, a local AI organization, NGO, affiliated with triple AI in New York, in U.S. and Silicon Valley. That we are learning from the U.S. colleagues and from all over the world. All data and scientific papers are going there. And we became a local chapter with academicians in the country with technology companies. So that's why my message to you, that you are in a very right, great place as technology uh, speaking ladies, but also whatever you do in your position, uh, find out, first of all, understand and be aware about your dreams. What is having a tattoo dash for yourself to become that person in the future as of today, please and be aware of it. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation again. Thank you so much, Esther. That was really inspiring. Um, really, really helpful, practical advice there um, that I think we can all take and, um, and apply. I think there was a question or two in the chat. Let me see if I can find it. Um, if you have a question and you want to unmute and ask, go for it. I think Viv had a question. Yes, I just want, hi, yes, and that was really inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, are there any resources or books or anything that you've um, learned from resources in terms of building self-belief? Uh, for the books, you mean books recommendation? Or yeah, anything like videos that you've watched or and anything in terms of... Um... I mean, there are plenty also. I can just share with you, I got plenty of the books also. And also, for example, one of the books is uh, Human 3.0, for example. It was very interesting. I was uh, flying to New York. I just read on the on the flight. It was saying, as the human being, you are thinking you are the best version. Microorganisms in the past, they were thinking they were the best, and humankind came in. And how you are thinking, as a carbon-based human being, you are better than silicon-based robots in the future. This why to understand the, the future, how it's evolving. And I would recommend some books. And my recommendation would be to read also Mikhail Kako, Futurist Physics, talks about the science technology, but from the future perspective. So I will be sharing with Bernie and also Russian about the recommended books. It will shape your future. Mostly we are stuck of today's world, today's challenges. Today we have got the, the COVID-19, well now we are dead. No, it's going to be over, of course. Then whenever you are going to look for beyond of today and understand how it is evolving, you will have a better position uh, in the lifetime. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Essen? I would have a question. What? Uh, you mentioned that um, organs can be printed and CD printed. How about knee joints? I'm just asking. They are, they are going to go first. first. When do you think they will be available? Well, I mean, uh, for example, I was, I was a Medtronic general manager uh, and we were producing robotic surgery also. It was the largest in the world, the number one global scale is $46 billion. And it is going to be, I think, for the majority of them, uh, would be minimum, uh, uh, I think, in the three years or five years, they are going to be available. For example, Steve Jobs uh, passed away because of the pancreas cancer. And now that is the artificial pancreas already produced. If he was alive, he will be surviving. I mean, he would have no issue. That's why if you take care of your organs today, and the future is coming, be aware, and be healthy and stay healthy. Any other final questions for Essen or any of our speakers? 
Well, there's um, a lot of engagement in the chat, um, just saying how inspiring everybody has been tonight. So thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, let's give Essen and Viv and Priya a final uh, virtual round of applause. And thank you so much to um, all of you who have come um, and engaged with us. We really appreciate you hanging out with us on the second Thursday. Um, if you have any other questions or want to chat about anything, um, I posted some contact information in the chat. I can post it again. But otherwise, um, have a wonderful evening. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everybody who came. Um, stay safe. And hopefully, we'll see you next month. Um, but otherwise, I'll leave this open for a few minutes if anybody wants to stick around and, and chat and network for a few minutes. But otherwise, have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.